of y'all, if you've ever had to prepare a, a message or any type of conversation where you work on it during the week and you're sitting there, man, what am I going to say about that? Anybody have that issue or that problem? I don't know exactly where to go and where to start. Then you think you have an idea of what you want to go and then it's like, man, I have way too much to say now. <laughs> and then when you get there and you start working on it and trying to finalize everything, he said, the Lord says, nah, just throw all that stuff out that you've been working on and there's something else. That was, that was me starting about last night. So all the stuff I thought I had doesn't really fit anymore, but that's okay. Those usually are good things. That usually means it's something better. But, uh, you know, the previous Torah portion, you know, it ended in chapter 24 of Exodus with, uh, with Adonai speaking and giving his words to Moses and the people of Israel. And the Israelites, when they were hearing all of these words, all of these statements, all of these commands from him, they agreed to them. It says in Exodus 24, verse 3, it says, So Moses came and told the people all the words of Adonai as well as all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Adonai has spoken, we will do. I know a, a lot of pastors and a lot of ministers go through life wishing that that would be the case for everything they always said. But we know that it's not. But when the Lord speaks, that needs to be our response, doesn't it? Everything that the Lord has spoken, we're supposed to do. It goes on to tell how Moses wrote down the words of Adonai. It mentions the scroll of the covenant, which, we read, uh, which he read to the people. Uh, and again, they agreed. This is in verse 7. It says, he took the scroll of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. Again, they said, all that Adonai has spoken, we will do and obey. And after this, uh, there was another writing it was mentioned. It was on these tablets of stone. Somehow they are, they're pretty important, we find out. It says, Adonai said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay there. And I will give you the tablets of stone with the Torah and the mitzvot, which I have written so that you may instruct them. There's something important that God wants to share, and he wants his people to hear it. He wants his people to be taught in it, and he wants his people to walk in it. And in all of this, you know, the glory of Adonai appeared and settled upon Mount Sinai with the cloud covering it for six days. You know, the, the, the Amer Aramaic translation, call, you know, the Targums call this the glory. They call it the Shekinah, right? Or in Tennessee, how do we say that in Tennessee when we say Shekinah? We, we say Shekinah, right? It's the Shekinah. But notice what day Moses was called up to enjoy this presence, this glory, this Shekinah. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered the glory of Adonai settled upon the mount, on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. Then on what day? Seven. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The appearance of the glory of Adonai was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of B'nai Israel. And so Moses entered into the midst of the cloud and went up onto the mountain. Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. It's on the seventh day. And, you know, I didn't even catch that reading that last week. It was on Shabbat that Moses is invited up into the glory, into the Shekinah of the Lord. And I believe there's an important lesson in that. Just in that little statement by itself, which I completely read over last week and didn't catch and didn't notice. What would have happened if Moses went up on a day of his own choosing? On one of the other days. It would have been by himself. <laughs> you hope that's the only thing that happened to him. Right? He very well could have died. Right? I mean, are you really supposed to just show up into the king's presence whenever you want to? Or does it require an invitation? 
See, what is, you know, how does Esther, you know, which is coming up here in the next few weeks with Purim and such, how do, what does Esther teach us about that? If you show up without the king's invitation, can you be put to death? Yeah. And we don't, we don't understand how that really works because that's not the kind of world that we live in. That's not the kind of nation that we have. Except I don't think we can just walk into the White House anytime we want to, can we? See, the Lord, Adonai, he has a certain protocol, a certain way of approach that has to be respected and followed. You know, to not follow the protocol, you know, to have the attitude, well, you know, the day doesn't really matter, like we often so hear in, in many Christian circles. It takes on a certain risk that we don't appreciate because we don't understand the nature of the one that we are wanting to appear before. We don't really recognize and understand his Shekinah because his glory also comes with it, his authority. We, you know, we're Americans after all. You know, America, to, to quote a few lines from different movies out there, you know, America has no king. America needs no king, right? And we bow to no one. And don't we have that attitude? Haven't we had that attitude from our beginning? It's funny that John Adams was the one who said, we have no king but Jesus. Mm-hmm. We have no king. We need no king. And yet we have no king but Yeshua. The seventh day, that Shabbat, is a day of invitation when the king is inviting us into his presence. We don't just get to show up whenever because that's disrespectful to the king and his authority. You know, Hebrews makes the point that you know, the, on this day of rest, the Shabbat day of rest, that some people in Israel's history didn't enter that rest because their walk was disobedient. They didn't follow his protocols. They didn't follow his ways. Hebrews talks about it like this. He says, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his work. It goes all the way back to creation. It's not just a, a matter of the Exodus or Mount Sinai. And again, in this passage, they shall never enter my rest. So then it remains for some to enter into it, yet those who formerly had good news proclaimed to them did not enter because of disobedience. Verse 7, again, God appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as it has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Hardening our hearts to his command, hardening our hearts to his ways, hardening our heart to the things that he tells us to do. Because shouldn't we be one of those that agrees that when we hear the word of God, everything he says, what should be our response? We will say, we will do, right? If we don't, that's because we are hardening our heart. It says, for if Joshua had given them rest, because some people said, well, well Joshua completed all that stuff. No, he, he didn't. If Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So there remains a Shabbat rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered God's rest has also ceased from his own work. Right? We, don't, we do no work on Shabbat. We don't work for ourselves. We don't work for our own kingdom on the Shabbat. But who is it okay to work for on Shabbat? You know, the priests, the Levites, weren't they still working and doing and pretty hard, right, in the temple? Yeah. Were they working for themselves when they did all that stuff? No. Who were they working for? They were working for the king. Right? We can do things for the king on Shabbat because we are living and working and operating for his kingdom. We cease from our own work just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter into that rest 
so that no one may fall through the same pattern of disobedience. He doesn't want us to repeat those same mistakes. Disobedience was the deciding factor, not taking the commands of the king seriously, not following his protocol or accepting his invitation of meeting. We have an invitation to meet with him how often? Every week, right? Is that all? Is that the only invitations that he gives us? There's the Moedim, right? There's the feast days. There's the Shabbat. But what about when you follow the proper protocol? What about when you have the invitation of the king who sits on the throne? When you are living and walking in obedience to him and approaching him in the way that he calls us to through the means by which he allows us to, Yeshua the Messiah, How does that work? Doesn't he say, therefore, let us draw near to the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help in time of need. In chapter 10, he says, let us draw near with a true heart in, in full assurance of faith, with hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and body washed with pure water. What has changed in our situation? You know, so many were not able to enter that rest because of disobedience. What changed in our situation? We follow the proper protocol. We have the invitation of Messiah, the king who sits on the throne of David. And it's our disobedience, our sin, that's been covered by his obedience when we come under the shadow of his wings. Again, it's not us doing it as we see fit. It's the protocol that he has set up. Verse 19 of chapter 10 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies, holies by the blood of Yeshua. He inaugurated a new and living way for us through the curtain that is his flesh. We also have a Kohen Gadol, a high priest, over God's household. So the Shabbat is that invitation into his Shekinah, into his glory, into his presence. It's that foretaste of glory divine, as one of the hymns would say. The Shabbat rest that is to come is one where we all will experience that Shekinah, that his glory with his fullness, where we can dwell in his presence and live. That's part of the promise. But until that day comes, until that day when we can fully live in, in his presence that we haven't really experienced yet, a way that has been made and is being carried on to completion, we're just waiting on it. We're just waiting on that day to get here. Until then, he's made a way to live and dwell among us. Right? We're not able to go and ascend and get into his presence and in his glory. So he is seeking a way to live and dwell among us, to tabernacle among us, his people. You know, that's really what this Torah portion is about, that, that he may dwell with us. This Torah portion is all about... And I, again, I hope all of this makes sense, because like I said, it's, it's been one of those things. So if it's, it may make sense up here, that doesn't mean it makes sense out there to y'all. So bear with me a little bit. But this is all about the goal of, of a holy God dwelling among a still sinful people, where we're not entirely walking in the way that we're supposed to in his way. But dwelling among them this sinful people, and the people not getting wiped out. That's, that's the goal of everything that we're reading in these Torah portions, where we can hear a word from the king and not hear an order for our death. And so, so to accomplish this goal, there has to be this protocol, this procedure, a certain way of doing things, a certain way that points forward to the ultimate answer of how he is going to do that and accomplish that. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 1, he says, Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Tell B'nai Israel to take up an offering for me. From anyone whose heart compels him, 
You are to take my offering. And these are the contributions which you are to receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet cloth, fine linen, and goat hair, ram skins dyed red, seal skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and for the breastplate. Have them make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them. You are to make it all precisely according to everything that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furnishings within, just so you must make it. In just those first few verses, do you get the impression that the details matter to God? Do details matter? I don't know about you growing up, but these are the kind of stuff and the kind of details that I read over pretty quickly. Anybody else? Let's, let's skip to the, the narrative part, the story part. You know, don't let me, I don't have to focus on all this stuff. But everything that follows, you know, in this Torah portion is so detailed, it's so exact, talking about the colors, talking about the lengths and measurements, numbers, descriptions, amounts, you know, weights and measures of how much gold they're supposed to use, you know, all fitting the design that God had in mind. It says, you are to raise up the tabernacle according to the plan which you were shown on the mountain. That's in chapter 26. For chapter 27, as it has been shown to you in the mountain, they are to make it just so. I mean, that's repeated multiple times. How seriously do you think Moses took these instructions? I mean, do you think he was... Yeah, uh, Moses was okay kind of fudging the numbers here and there. Do you think he excused or looked over shoddy or substandard work and said, yeah, well, you know, that's, that's good enough. I doubt it. Everything listed here, everything listed in these chapters, even when we don't understand it all, even when we don't, it doesn't make sense to us, does it still matter? Because whether we understand it, whether it makes sense to us isn't the point. It's still following the plan. It's still following the design that God has. All of it establishes a protocol to meet with our Creator and our Redeemer, and all to have the presence of that, that dwelling presence, that glory, that that divine in our midst. That is his goal. That is what he wants to do. That is something that the world, when you think about it, so really desperately wants. We like to think that the world doesn't care and the world's not interested, but really the world desperately wants something that they can't even identify. Even when they don't know what they're looking for or how to describe it or how to identify it, they know that they want and need something. The world is looking in for, to fill that longing in their heart for something more because this world, we, we know on a, on a base level that there's something wrong here, that this world is not enough, something is missing. You know, no matter who you're talking to, you know, the, the transcendental meditationists, the universalists, every religion, every belief system ultimately wants to connect with something beyond merely human. And even atheists, people who claim there is no God, they still want to connect to something beyond our world. That's why they have the telescope so pointed out there waiting to get any kind of signal from anything out there that they can identify as saying, hey, at least we're not alone out here. They're wanting some sort of universal higher consciousness, some alien life else, elsewhere in the universe. Even if, and even if it's not out there, now they're starting to look into the digital and starting to look for the artificial intelligence. They're just desperate to find somebody else to talk to because they're typically boring, right? But all of that stuff that they're searching for, that they're looking for, that's us. That's Humanity wanting to do and find all of that and have that divine presence dwelling with us on our terms and not his. That's the bottom line of all of it. In, in, in our way, we project what we want to find 
you know, what it's, whether it's aliens or past lives or oneness with the universe, that quest for meaning, significance, and connection, you know, it's going to take all kinds of different forms. And ultimately, even the Tower of Babel was the same kind of thing. You know, building this tower to reach to the heavens to make a name for themselves, by themselves, without any kind of help from God. They wanted to elevate their name, despite the promise from God that what, as Peter talks about, when we humble ourselves before God, what does he promise to do? He will lift us up in due time. Is he going to be able to lift us up higher than any tower they could have ever built? Yes. But they didn't want to do it his way. They didn't want to wait for his time. And so just like Babel, the modern world is desperately searching for some kind of dwelling presence of the divine. We just want it on our own terms and not his. Without realizing and without seeing the heart of God, that that's really what he's trying to do too. That's what he wants to do. That sense of broken relationship is what he's trying to repair. And we're the ones that broke it, but it takes him to fix it. You know, I thought about it like this this morning. You know, I, I received all sorts of toys as a child, you know, whether it's birthday or when we celebrated Christmas and all those things, right? There was a lot of times when I received the toy and I knew how to play, the t play with the toy, I also knew how to break the toy. Anybody else? How many of you kids, when you received those things, knew how to fix the toy? Not very many of us know how to do that. And so what would we do? We would often take it to the one who gave us the gift, typically our parents or whatever else. We would take it to them and we would ask, can you fix this? Sometimes they could, right? Sometimes they couldn't. We know it's broken. We can't fix it, and we're hoping that they can. That's the situation. And all this detail about the Mishkan, the tabernacle, was for the purpose of God dwelling in their midst. Whose idea was it? It was his. Whose design was it? Was it Moses just a, a smart guy? He's just an architect or whatever else? No, it really wasn't his plan either. It was God's design. Also that their king can dwell among them, speak to them, and lead them. That's what he was going for. Hello. I'm missing... About half my message here. Well, there's that. Okay, it was just something, something else was out of place. Exodus 25 says, I will meet with you there. I will speak with you from above the atonement cover, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony about all that I will command you for B'nai Israel. He wants to meet with us. He invites us to come and meet with him. He wants to speak to us so we can hear his voice. You know, as much as the world wants to connect with the divine, we take for granted how much he wants to meet with us. When you look at the, the Mishkan, when you look at the tent of meeting, the tent of the testimony, that's, this is describing how he wants to do it. It's the place for his glory to dwell. And he starts, when he starts describing all of this, he doesn't start with all the exterior stuff and work his way in. Where does he start? He starts at the heart of it all. He starts on the inside, the most inner place, and works his way out. He starts at the heart of it all. The place for his glory to dwell, he starts at the heart of the, this Mishkan. And this is just a couple of pictures of things. 
You know, he starts with the, you know, the Holy of Holies, the most holy of place, the ark uh, with the atonement cover, the mercy seat. What is, in essence, his throne on earth, right? It's at the heart of the Mishkan. And then when, when all of that whole tabernacle gets set up, and then he has all of the people around it, all of the camps of all the tribes around him, what does that look like? Isn't that at the center of it all? So the Mishkan, the presence of God, the throne of God is at the heart of the camp. Everything about the, the camp, the setup of things is supposed to keep the presence of God essential, central, the most important part. His abiding with us and us abiding with him. His Shekinah, his, see now I'm back into my Tennessee here. His Shekinah, his glory with us. And what's beautiful about this picture, his glory being in the midst of the people. You know, that's the, the way that the, the, those Aramaic uh, Targums talk about. Yonatan describes this verse very interesting. And when we look at these passages, see if it seems familiar to you. All right, so this is Exodus 25, verse 8 in the, from the Aramaic Targum. It says, And they shall make a sanctuary to my name, that my Shekinah may dwell among them according to all that I show thee, the likeness of the tabernacle and the likeness of all its vessels, so shalt thou make. Verse 22 says, And I will appoint my word with thee there, and will speak with thee from above the mercy seat between the two cherubim that are there, uh, that are over the ark of the testament, concerning all that I may command thee for the sons of of Israel. These concepts of his shkinah, his glory, the concept of appointing my word, the word of God, the word being, uh, being God, is throughout these Aramaic translations, these Targums. They reveal the foundation of, the, of the, much of the Jewish thought in that Second Temple era. And it influences even elements within the Gospels, particularly the Gospel of John. So keep these in mind about his glory and his word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and then dwelt, tabernacled among us. And we looked upon his what? His Shkinah, His glory. The Shkinah of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. Then verse 16, it says, Out of His fullness we have all received grace on top of grace. The Torah, His word, right? Torah was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Yeshua, the Messiah, And what's, what's the big thing that's missing here? Y'all remember? There's no but. They're, they're not in conflict with each other. Both the Torah and the grace and truth through Yeshua are both examples of the two types of grace that he talks about there. They're not in conflict with each other. They are in tandem and working together with each other. He says, no one has ever seen God but the one and only God in the Father's embrace has made him known. Which goes very interesting with that, uh, that video you sent me, Ty, about the, uh, the cherubim. That they were, there's an element of embrace that they, that's within the thinking of how they were patterned. All of that, all of this from John chapter 1 is language found within Jewish thought and in and around the, his tabernacle, his dwelling presence in the midst and in the heart of his people. You know, and it struck me, even reading last night as we were together, how in this Torah portion, you know, it starts again with his throne. And then it, you, when you're reading this Torah portion, it moves from his throne to the table of showbread, right? 
where they have how many loaves of bread on there? Twelve, representing each of the tribes, right? And then it moves to the golden lampstand, right? This is talked about in a later Torah portion, but it's not actually in this one. But you have the table of showbread, those 12 loaves. Then it goes to the light of the menorah, which is filled with the, the oil, which represents in many ways the, the Holy Spirit, right? And then as it moves outward, you know, into different, into future Torah portions and stuff, it gets into the bronze laver, it gets into the altar of birth offerings. Those are all in this as well. All of these are the protocol from when you're out here, this is how things are brought into the king's presence. Most of the Israelites are never going to go past here, right? Only the priests and the Levites come in here, but they take what you bring to the door, and where do they take it? They bring your cares and concerns, your, your, your offerings here, but they bring your prayers and your petitions here to the altar of incense, and that's where the king hears the prayer of his people. All of this is establishing that protocol of gaining audience with your king. It represents, and, it, and when, you, when you're in here, this in many ways, this is what really struck me, and this is where I'm still hoping it makes sense to all of you, uh, is that you know, this represents in many ways the, the, the throne room, the presence of God, of the, of the king, and gaining that audience with the king. But in his throne room, there's a table with food on it, like a banquet table, right? There's a, a menorah, there's a, a candle to, to light, to fill the room with light, so they're not going to be sitting in darkness. You know, it struck me that these 12 loaves resting on the table, representing the 12 tribes, are like those who are invited to sit at the table in the presence of the king. To share this meal of relationship, to share this meal of covenant with him. How many times when they are establishing the covenant, does it always, it always has to have a meal involved with it. And so every Shabbat, as they are coming together, as we are meeting with the king, he is inviting us to share the table of the king. You know, even David, King David, was able to show mercy to one of Saul's descendants by doing what? Allowing him to, to eat from the king's table. Daniel and the, the three Hebrews that were there in Babylon were supposed to have been blessed, right, by being allowed to do what? Eat food from the king's table. Now they realized that eating from his table would be, be violating their covenant with their king. To share a meal with him and be seated at his table. The, the pieces of bread are like they're being seated at the table. To share a meal of covenant with him. It's no surprise that one of the central points of Jewish life, of entering into the Shabbat and accepting the invitation of the king, is to do what? To sit down and do what? Eat a meal together. It's one of the first things that they've been doing to enter Shabbat since these days. Sit down as a family and enjoy a meal. And you have the mikdosh, the holy place, symbolically with this table and this menorah. It's set up like a place to come in and share a meal together. And when you think about it like that. It's, is it any surprise that Yeshua talks about banquets so often? He talks about sharing a meal. In Luke 14, Yeshua starts out talking about being invited to a wedding banquet. And if, when you show up at the wedding banquet, are you supposed to take the, the, the highest seat of honor? He says, don't do that. Why not? 
Somebody more important than you might show up and you have to be asked to step down. That'll be embarrassing. Don't want to do that. Take the lower seat. And when the host shows up and says, well, wait a minute, what are you doing sitting down here? Come up. Then you're honored, right? Verse 12 of Luke 14, Yeshua was also saying to the one who invited him, when, your host, when you host a luncheon or a dinner, he says, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they might invite you in and return, you, return as payback. Does that mean we're never supposed to have each other over? No. But when you host a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. While this statement is true, that we shouldn't leave out people that we deem oftentimes on the lower end of life, isn't it also true spiritually? In other words, should, when we have our Shabbat dinners and things, should we only invite people who agree with us and fellow believers who understand and do everything exactly the way that we do? Shouldn't we invite those who are poor in spirit? Shouldn't we invite those who have been injured and crippled and have difficulty walking this life of faith, those who are blind to the truth of God's love and his presence? Shouldn't we invite them to our fellowship meals? Yeah, we should. Isn't that how Shabbat meals should be treated, as an opportunity to bring someone into the king's presence? Isn't that what hospitality, that the kind of hospitality that Abraham would show? You know, Yeshua says of such people who are willing to host a banquet and invite those who are the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, he says, and you will be blessed. Since they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And now hearing this, one of those dining with Yeshua somebody had been invited to be there with him, said to him, blessed is he who eats the bread or eats bread in the kingdom of God. So there is this expectation in all of these protocols of the king that he's talking about. There's this expectation, this hope of eating bread in the kingdom in the messianic era. And what's on that table in the holy place. So Yeshua, he even confirms all this expectation, the idea that all of God's people, and he starts, and then he includes even the Gentiles. He includes the Gentile centurion who has that sick servant who had this great faith that they will be gathered together to celebrate our redemption. The, the way that is made to allow us into the king's presence to celebrate our redemption together as seen in the Passover. Because we will all then get to enjoy a meal with all of those who have come before, all of those forefathers who have been trusting in the promise. He says, when Yeshua heard this, this exclamation of faith from the centurion saying, hey, you don't even have to come all the way to my house. You just say the word and I know he'll be healed. It says, he marveled and said to those who were following, amen, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. He said that to a, a centurion. Moreover I, moreover, I tell you that many will come from the east and the west, and they will recline at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. There is going to be a banquet there's going to be a celebration, that sense of reclining at the table hints at Passover, doesn't it? Because what's one of the questions that comes up during the Passover celebration? Why on this night, right? How does it go? Why are we reclining at the table on this night? Why don't we sit? Right? That's part of the whole storytelling of all of that. But... Guess who's else, who else is going to be at that table? 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. We're, we're going to be there with them, sitting at the same table with them. There are going to be people gathered. That's part of the promise, gathered from the east and the west, from all over, wherever they have been scattered, and those that are taking hold of the tzitzit of these Jews and coming with them, right? Gathered by Messiah. And the angels that he sends out to his people will be brought back to a meal, a time of fellowship. And the tabernacle functions in many ways like the banquet hall for that feast, for that what is essentially the wedding, right? The Torah, and you think about it like a wedding because what is the Torah? The Torah is there. And all those things that represent the, the ketubah, the promise between Adonai and his bride. All of that is there and kept with the ark. The tabernacle points to that wedding banquet, that royal wedding of the king and his bride. And what we have here in the, in the tabernacle with all of these things is kind of like the, uh, how many of y'all, if you had a, a big wedding, um, did anybody have to make a seating chart or a seating arrangement? Anybody have to do that? Yeah? This is the seating chart. The arrangements for the promised wedding that is to come with all of the, the decorations, with all of the, the altar, the cleansing, the robes, all that comes to prepare God's people for entering into the king's presence. All of that protocol of, of a wedding banquet in the kingdom of God. That's what, really what this tabernacle is even pointing to and directing our hearts, our attention, our future toward. And it's no wonder that when we get to the book of Revelation, how does it close? One of the last things that happens, you know, I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, or like the rumbling of powerful sun, thunder saying, Hallelujah, for Adonai Elohei Tzavaot reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints, of the Kedoshim. And then the angel tells me, right, how fortunate are those who have been invited to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. He also tells me these are the true words of God. And what does he want to do at the tabernacle? Does he not want to dwell with them? Does he not want to speak with them and give them his word? It's after the wedding, the bride and the bridegroom, they dwell together permanently in the place that he has prepared where she can always hear his words of love, his words of grace, where his shkinah, his glory, both surrounds her and covers her. And the tabernacle is the picture of that glorious future. Because just as Moses was commanded to do everything according to that he was shown on the mountain, is God going to make sure that everything goes according to plan? That everything is fulfilled according to the plan that he has had prepared for how long? How long has this been the plan? Hasn't this always been the plan? Wasn't Yeshua, wasn't the Messiah slain before the foundation of the world? So this is not plan B. This is not, oh, oh I better figure something else out because the first thing I tried didn't work. This has been the plan all along. And it's a glorious future. And it's a glorious plan. It's all going to go according to the plan that God has made. And that day is coming soon. Because when we see, when we hear the shofar sound, 
He says, the Lord himself shall come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and the blast of God's shofar, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. It's the beginning of this gathering from the east and the west. Then we who are alive, who are left behind, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's how things are going according to plan. And that's the plan that is coming. And what is the protocol? How do we gain access to that plan? How do we acquire that seat at the table? The protocol that he has provided is the offering of Yeshua, the Messiah. And he, who is the light of the world, who's the, right there in the midst of the holy place. And he is also the one who is the bread of life, who is providing it all for those who are invited to the place at the table. That is what we are missing out on when we don't when we skip over these details, when we don't pay attention to the tabernacle and all some of these plans and we don't understand those things and seek to understand those, we are missing out on the promise of the banquet that is in our future. And so let us meet with him on his days of appointment. Let us meet with him and follow his protocol so we can anticipate more and more the promise that he has to fulfill, that wedding that is to come. Amen.